God bless you all. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're delighted to host for the sixth time Dr. Daniel Hinshaw, who has been carrying us through deep reflections uh, upon the role of medicine and the particular challenges that are facing uh, people today in the medical climate in which we live. I hope you've been able to see some of our previous episodes. I'd like to make a short introduction of Daniel, uh, Dr. Hinshaw for those who haven't tuned in previously. Dr. Daniel Hinshaw, MD, is an Orthodox Christian layman and a professor emeritus of surgery at the University of Michigan School of Medicine and consultant in palliative medicine at the University of Michigan Geriatric Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the United States. He's taught palliative care at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in New York and to medical professionals and clergy in international settings, including Ethiopia, Uganda, Serbia, Romania, and Lebanon. He's taught for several years as a visiting professor at Transylvania University in Romania and at the St. John of Damascus Theological Institute and St. George's University Hospital at the University of Balamond in Lebanon. He's an accomplished author, having published more than 80 papers in scientific journals and volumes and in collected works as well as publishing several books. And he has been so gracious as to teach us. Dr. Hinshaw, we're very delighted to be with you and to hear your reflections on the subject of kenosis. Thank you, Father. It's, it's a, a joy to be with you. And um, kenosis is an interesting way, to, I think, to end our, the series because it, it is a way of thinking about suffering and its relationship to death that I would like to um, share with you. Thank you. I wanted to quote from the Blessed Augustine. Uh, and this, I think, really speaks to what I call the arc of human existence. Uh, this is from his Confessions. For we know, O Lord, that the extent to which something once was, but no longer is, is the measure of its death. And the extent to which something once was not, but now is, is the measure of its beginning. So as you think about the contour of that statement, you realize that what we're talking about is, is not a completed event, but a process. And I think that's an important concept that we should keep uh, in our minds as we explore this uh, uh, way of thinking about kenosis and how it and its relationship to suffering. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting painting by the Norwegian symbolist painter Edvard Munch. Uh, it's called Four Ages in Life. And I, it, you might be able to see it better if you pull it up um, uh, on the internet. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is that each of these figures, uh, four, the four female figures here, are, are, I guess you could think of them as stages in the same person's life, potentially. And they're all walking on the street. And the only person of the four that actually engages directly with the viewer is the little girl. And she has kind of a subtle, tentative, Scandinavian smile, not no, no broad <laughs> grin, but a, a, just a hesitating smile. Uh, but she's she's actually engaging with with us. The next person uh, to her right is a woman who's probably I guess in her maybe late twenties, uh, you know maybe maybe a, a mother, a lot of family responsibilities. She's not looking directly at us, but she's certainly looking forward and about her business. And then the third person, which almost has something like a cadaveric expression on her uh, side of her face, she looks kind of hollowed out is looking off to the side. It's almost as if that individual who's now in late midlife or maybe early uh, uh, late age or old age uh, is hesitating. It's like, well, I'm not sure whether I want to go forward or not. Uh, and then finally, the last figure, the elderly lady, is bent over uh, with a certain sense of resignation, moving forward, looking at the ground to which she's going to return in the not so distant future. So there's this, a lot of meaning, I think, in this uh, painting. And I would uh, propose to you that, and I'll define it here in a moment, but that kenosis, in a sense, 
is the choreographer of our suffering. It is the choreographer of this process that leads uh, unto our death as the final outcome. The next slide, please. So I showed this uh, in a previous presentation, this image of the bridegroom of the suffering Christ. Uh, but I want to put it in the context of quoting from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied, or the Greek word is ekonosin, himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. I might emphasize here, too, that putting that into context, a servant in, in the Greek word is doulos. It would, it, most servants were slaves. So he, he was putting himself in the lowest form of humanity uh, to elevate the human person, uh, to make, make it possible for us to live by grace uh, the life that God has by his very nature. This is this extraordinary paradox that, that, that is at the heart of our faith. And, and it's this emptying, this depletion. Uh, the, the, class, the word in classical Greek is, is very, you know, it's, it can be even have a crude meaning, but it's, 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 it is an emptying uh, or a, a profound loss. Uh, next slide. So then in the divine kenosis, the word of God voluntarily assumed human nature, including the involuntary kenosis that defines the arc of suffering and death to heal and transform human mortality into a path toward union with God. In his invitation to follow him, uh, the incarnate Lord encourages his followers to voluntarily engage with their own involuntary kenosis to take up their crosses in imitation of his example. And so our, our, our struggle with the passions of spiritual warfare are, are very much uh, in a way uh, at the core of this uh, voluntary embracing of our involuntary kenosis. And so each of our lives is choreographed by uh, the losses that we experience, maybe we're even born with, uh, that condition this struggle. Next slide. Here's an image from Dumbarton Oaks, a museum in Washington, D.C. I like it because it's a, uh, a countercultural image from the Roman Empire, typically uh, in the uh, Hellenistic period. This is about the time of Christ when this was uh, made. Uh, uh, usually had a vaunted image of, you know, kind of the Michelangelo's David kind of image of the perfect body, perfect human form. And here's a, a, a very thin uh weak individual. He has a, a problem with his, his left wrist is dropped. He has a foot, uh, club foot. He's, his ribs are showing. He's either dying of cancer or advanced tuberculosis or some other chronic illness. So he's not your typical ideal Roman hero. So I want to make some points with this image, though, in mind. Whereas the kenosis of Christ, his self-emptying was completely voluntary. Human beings in their mortality experience an involuntary form of kenosis as they age, which begins at the biological or physical level. And that's what we probably perceive the most. Uh, it is a stripping away, a, deletion, a depletion, or an emptying or impoverishment of those elements which support function and independence. So just as suffering embraces all aspects of the person, so also the involuntary kenosis of the dying spreads from the physical, to the psychological, social, and ultimately spiritual aspects of the person. Uh, next slide. Let me broaden that definition a little bit. Uh, so I would say that kenosis, one way to think about kenosis or this involuntary kenosis that we experience as human beings is an evolving encounter with losses and the limits they impose, both internal and external to the person over time. And so you can imagine that those losses that we experience and encounter extend from us from within us, to our neighbor, to those we love, to our community, and to the entire cosmos. And as I mentioned before, it's a process with elements both common among and unique to individuals that choreographs human suffering with death as the ultimate outcome. Um, it's, a it's a way of thinking about what dying is. Losses reflect the process 
of kenosis operating in individual lives and through relationships extending to communities and ultimately to the cosmos. Next slide. I want to uh, just emphasize at a certain level, even below the individual person, down to the cellular level, the cells that make up our bodies, uh, there's, an, there's an aspect of this going on. Uh, so this involuntary kenosis is operative throughout our life that it pre preserves our lives uh, to a certain degree. So in other words, in many of our organs, uh, the cells that make up those organs become fully differentiated cells, and then eventually they respond to a signal uh, to undergo programmed cell death, or the Greek word is, uh, that's been coined is apoptosis. Uh, and that refers to kind of a uh, falling uh, apart of the cell into different pieces. And then it's consumed by the other neighboring cells. It's quite an extraordinary thing to observe. But in this highly choreographed dying process, they actually enable the survival of the host. So what happens if the cell refuses to uh, follow this this kenotic process. And in this picture, you can see the central cell is undergoing this apoptosis. It's, it's breaking up and then it's going to be consumed by its neighbors. Next slide, please. Well, this, the cell that doesn't undergo kenosis uh, refuses to, uh, or the kenosis of, of following the program for cell, the program for death, uh, it uh, becomes a cancer cell. So in a sense, Et, you know, eternal life in this world, in this fallen world, is cancer. Uh, and so, and so it rebels. It, it, I mean, I'm putting this in, you know, and I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing ourselves, but in a sense, this, the cell is experiencing or expressing a, rebe a form of rebellion. So the satanic kind of re rebel uh, effect is occurring even at, our, at the level of our cells within our bodies. So it seeks immortality, but of course, in the process, it kills its host. Um, and in, interestingly, when individual cells lose this, their ability to respond to the apoptotic program and eventually are transformed by unrestrained signals for growth, they also lose their connectedness. And there's another, uh, their, their kinonia, they're, they don't, they're no longer in communion, they're no longer in fellowship with their adjacent cells, with a larger community of cells. In fact, some cells, this is really heinous, I mean, certain types of cancers actually express, after they've gone through this transformation, this evil transformation, they express on their surface uh, proteins that cause pain uh, within that local area. Um, and so then they spread. And so when they lose their ability to, to maintain contact with their adjacent cells, they, they have this ability to what we call metastasize or spread to other parts of the body. And this is a sense of cellular homelessness. The Greek word is anoikis. Um, and, and this is Normally, it, when, when a cell is separated from its connection to other cells, it, it undergoes this program cell death. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, cancer, next slide, uh, becomes a, a, a metaphor, a powerful metaphor for the kind of isolation that affects the whole organism when it seeks purely its own interest and no longer responds to the other, to the non-self. So we no longer, you know, it's no longer loving its neighbor as itself. It no longer cooperates with its neighbor. It no longer recognizes that it must lay its life, its, down its life at some point for the good of its community. Uh, and, and so self-absorption, pride, and ultimately presumption of the divine prerogative, the worst of the passions are spiritual cognates then of this cancer state, which is played out even at the level of ourselves. Next slide. Now this Good grief. You know, even Charlie Brown can't escape kenosis. I thought it would be interesting. I don't know if, if they can read the uh, captions. I'll try to read them. So his friend, his friend is telling him, do you think that things change as we get older, Chuck? And then Charlie responds, well, my dad has told me about this very nice theater that used to be in the neighborhood where he grew up. When he was very small, the theater seemed huge, but as the years went by, the theater got narrower and narrower. And then his friend says, narrower and narrower? How could a theater get narrower and narrower? Are you getting philosophical on me, Chuck? Well, and Charlie Brown responds, maybe there comes a time when you get even older, when the theater becomes white again. <laughs> And then the, his girlfriend says, girls don't like it when a boy gets philosophical, Chuck. 
And then Charlie leaves and says, I'm going home. I have a feeling that our backyard is shrinking. So <laughs> here we are. Even, even, even the comic strips recognize there's something going on around us that we can't avoid, uh, can't ignore. And, I, and, and it's kenosis. Next slide, please. So uh, this is, of course, the classic image for, you know, not Charlie Brown, but uh, an icon of, of St. Sisoes of the, from the fourth century. He's contemplating the bones of Alexander the Great, who conquered the world in, you know, in 10 years, and yet he dies. So what do we see then, or who do we see in the mirror of our kenosis? The process of kenosis, beginning with his physical decline and increasing functional limitations associated with aging, and more dramatically manifested for many near the end of the life in the phenomenon of cancer or these other chronic debilitating illnesses extends to all aspects of the person. It eventually strips away any remaining illusions and pretense that we have. And we have to, we have to kind of face ourselves. Hopefully we avoid the doctor dance that we talked about earlier. Next slide. So if we do embrace our kenosis, if we, if we say, well, okay, what, how can I make use of my mortal condition and, and, and this evolving process uh, through how, of how my suffering, my individual suffering is choreographed with that of others, we can possibly actually look to and recognize the other. So with this emptying of our egoistic self, this blessed poverty as a solid foundation, we finite mortal human beings can now fully engage and reconcile with the other, first with our neighbor and then perhaps with the ultimate other. Barriers erected by the self have been eliminated. What remains is the extraordinary paradox of real health, health that is only fully consummated in death. I'll give you a very simple example. If I make a choice uh, to offer hospitality to another person uh, and, and share, that means I've already undergone a canonic act. I've, 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 I've limited myself or limited myself uh, in terms of some option that I might have taken. I might have used that food or whatever the thing I'm offering to someone else by sharing. And so in, in my canonic act, I'm actually opening up another possibility though. So kenosis in one sense is a narrowing, but like Charlie Brown said, maybe it is getting wider, but in a different way. Next slide. So I want to look at these uh, very simple images and kind of reflect on them together with you. This is what we often refer to as the palliative paradigm. And, it, and it's a very simple rectangle that's bisected by a, a line, an oblique line that creates two triangles. Uh, and I would sort of describe this as living in the shadow of death. So. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the diagnosis, and that's diagnosis of a life-threatening or life-limiting illness, like cancer or, or advanced heart disease or, or other condition. And as you progress toward death on the bottom line, you can notice that at the very beginning of that experience, most of the effort, and this is, of course, in our encounter with the health professionals, is to seek a cure, to seek a way of prolonging our life, if not curing our, uh, ourselves of the uh, being cured of the of the threat of the cancer or whatever the underlying problem is, but at the same time, if we as we progress toward that situation where it may not be curable, uh, we can expand uh, our efforts in terms of, of of alleviating physical symptoms, other sources of, di of distress, and focusing on the one needful thing of of, of really addressing. Uh, our journey toward God. And so this is the, uh, the kind of typical image. Uh, let me modify it now with the next slide and propose to you that this journey really begins at birth or maybe even at our conception. I mean, so, so you know, some people, uh, by God's grace, have, have various disabilities when they're born. Uh, and so they were acquired these in the womb. So it really maybe even, maybe I should even have made that uh, at the point of conception. But needless to say, from the very beginning of our life, we don't have necessarily a straight line, but we have these sort of ups and downs where they're, the green arrows are basically pointing at different moments of loss. So maybe 
even natural kinds of things. Maybe the fact that we grow up and we move away from our parents, we, we go through the natural separation of, of adulthood, uh, or maybe we have, we, we lose a, a loved one, uh, you know, a beloved grandparent or, or parent, uh, or, or we have a, a loss, um, a divorce or some other uh, traumatic relational change. Uh, each of these points, or it could be a, a, a traumatic physical event. We could have had a car accident, which made us disabled. Or So you can imagine a number of, and variety of events that involve the physical, psychological, social domains, and ultimately the spiritual domain of the person occurring over a lifetime, where we might focus more on sort of, uh, let's fix the problem. That would be the curative side. And on the other side of it, uh, emphasis, the, the curve sort of shifts back more toward a focus on on relief of distress and accepting the limitations that we're uh, having to deal with now. So that would be living in the, the shadow of death from the very beginning. But living, but living. This is the important thing. Not not uh, uh, in some gloomy state, but but living in, a, in in with our eyes wide open to reality. But then I think the final stage of this that I'd like to speak to is the next slide. And that is a journey to simplicity. So we, as we move along that same trajectory from birth to our death, we, we really shift from, uh, from uh, what I'd like to describe as um, a transition fully from action as our mode of being to being as our mode of action. And so we, and it's really uh, another way of thinking about it is sort of a, as a Martha Ma, uh, Mary conundrum. So, so we, we, we are scurrying around doing lots of good things, but ultimately we're called by Christ to do the one needful thing, which is to be at his feet. And so our, our, our journey eventually has to shift from, you know, action ultimately to being. Um, and I think that, and so even though, that implies um, a, something that's very frightening to a 21st century person who is used to having lots of activities, lots of stuff to fill your time, hopefully not the doctor dance, but, but something you know, that, that can potentially complicate our, our, uh, our encounter with reality. Uh, we shed all of that so that we can encounter the, the ultimate reality, uh, the the who behind that reality, um, and so that I think is is so. So true simplicity is not something. It's not being a simpleton. It's something very profound, but also something very foreign uh, to the way we live uh, in in the in this busy world of ours. And I'd like to end, I think, with a final slide. Uh, Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory, who was a dean uh, several years ago at St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York, uh, told me once how, how fond he was of this Western saint. Uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux uh, died in her 20s uh, from tuberculosis, but she uh, was a, an interesting character. She actually went to the Pope at age 15 and appealed to the Pope directly so that she could be enter the Carmelite uh, monastery uh, where she died, uh, I think at age 15. So, uh, and she had a conversation uh, which was recorded in her autobiography with one of the older nuns uh, who spoke to this issue of kenosis and simplicity because she was already, I think, pretty ill at the time of this conversation. And this is what the uh, older nun told her. It strikes me, my child, that you cannot have much to say to your superiors. And St. Therese uh, replied, why, why do you think that, mother? And then the response came, well, because your soul is very simple. But when you are perfect, you will be more simple still. The nearer one gets to God, the simpler one becomes. Thank you for your attention. Um, <laughs> My goodness, my goodness. I have many thoughts, and I want to throw one out to you now, good doctor, uh, hearing that marvelous reflection upon the fact that the way up is down. 
And I've always loved the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes uh, in the Old Testament, where Solomon draws this beautiful, using many different pictures of life to describe the progress of old age. And he, he d- describes it like a house kind of falling apart. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the pillars are, are shaking and um, you can't hear the dancing in the street and the chirping of a bird makes you arise from your sleep because you can't go back to sleep. You're not sleeping very deeply. Uh, it's a it's an absolutely fascinating conclusion to a, a book that is trying to uh, shake us free from putting too much stock in earthly ambitions. Uh, and he ends with a reminder that whatever happens, remember you're going to account before God. He he inserts this this great theme of judgment uh, at the end of the text. And I'm just wondering, I, I've always thought to myself that this, the valuation of aging and of decline uh, is so low in our culture with the, the exaltation of youth as kind of the, the true definition of being a human being, uh, that you, you address this so beautifully. I, I just think to, to develop a, a mind that when when you can't sleep as well, this is because this is not loss. This is gain. If it's combined with prayer, if your libido is decreased significantly, this is not an end to union, but a call to reach a greater union. Uh, that's, that's deeper. And that can be, uh, obscured by, uh, a continued overemphasis upon the things of the earth and there's a there's a fantastic letter that saint john chrysostom wrote when he was young to a woman who was young and had lost her husband it's uh it's usually just called in our in our in his corpus a letter to a young widow she had lost her husband whose name was therasius and he was a very virtuous beautiful young person and Chrysostom, she was just devastated, just absolutely devastated. And Chrysostom wrote her a letter. And he, he, took, he took what was the misery of her life, um, young, protectionless. The one that she loved and wanted to be with so much was removed from her. She had all sorts of new threats, of course, around her life. And he turned the whole thing she, she kind of had this forcible, canonic experience where she was just thrown down. And he took it and he said, you have to perceive with the eyes of faith what God is giving you right now. And he told her, he said, widowhood, he started by saying, look, widowhood, usually abhorred uh, by our culture, and these days is viewed as needing to be corrected as soon as possible <laughs> by, by finding as young a, a companion as you can and starting over uh, and just replay, replaying it. Uh, he said, widowhood is not a term of reproach, but it's a term of honor in the scripture. And he says, if you, what you should recognize is that the one that you love hasn't ultimately been removed from you, he said. He says, because love is the ultimate binder of two things that neither time nor distance can separate. And that if you if you believe in God, if you trust in the resurrection, he said, you will see him again. Both in this life, that's pretty shocking. He says both in this life and in the next life. And he says that what you should do is meditate on his virtues guard your bed from the touch of any other man develop your love for god more and then you will move from a beautiful earthly union to a union that is many more times glorious you'll see him again in the next life 
in a radiance that you can't imagine, like the sun. And probably, if you're sincere about this, you'll see him in the meantime in divine visions that God allows you to, to see. And you'll be able to see his gentle smile and his loving eyes and hear from him the words that you want to hear. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful, encouraging letter. It's such an encouraging letter. And so um, it, it struck me as, as radical as what you just said. You're, you're taking the entire worldview of our culture and flipping it on its head and saying that decomposition is a move to being. It's a move to greater experience and more significant life. And it, it seems to me that that's exactly what St. John Chrysostom was saying, uh, not particularly in her health condition, but in her th this radical kenosis that had fallen upon her in the loss of her husband, that widowhood to the world is certainly one thing, but here, because of Christ, it's something completely different. As a matter of fact, he capstoned the whole talk by saying to her, because for you to judge r rightly, my dear, you must understand that your husband's death, this death is not death. It's immigration. It's an immigration <laughs> to another land. That's great. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the, whole the, the, the commitment of marriage is a canonic choice. You know, the, 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 the person who is promiscuous allegedly has the choice of everybody, but really nobody, because there really is no depth at all to the relationship. You know, there, there's not a real relationship that's formed. So when you make a commitment to one, you then open up a pathway to some great mystery and depth, but it's a canonic choice nonetheless. Mm. And I think it, it just fits with what with what you're you're quoting from Saint John Chrysostom that 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 canonic choice that she made originally was extending into eternity. You know. It's, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Oh. Yeah. So our so our suffering is is uh, is our entree into real life. I mean, the, the suffering that we experience ontologically, you know, as, our, as a, our core being, as dying creatures, we live, you know, dying we live. Not to be avoided, but embraced in faith. Yeah. Soberly, but with joy. Soberly. Well, good doc. I want to make up a, some six more talks, six more <laughs> talks on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> and con and continue our conversation because it has been so blessed for me. I I'm deeply grateful and very humbled uh, to receive the this instruction from you. And on behalf of everyone who's going to benefit from it by watching Patristic Nectar Films, I want to say a most sincere thank you for the amount of time and effort that you've set aside to be with us. May God continue to bless you and your family and your beautiful ministry. Uh, both to our bodies and to our souls. Well, thank you, Father, and a blessed journey to Pascha in the coming thank days. Thank you. Thank you, and you too. Hey, everyone, God bless you. Mark your calendar, June 3rd to 5th, our annual Patristic Nectar Conference. You are going to be thrilled at the lineup. Here it is. Holy Orthodoxy, presenting the Christian faith. Go to our website and you can find out there how to participate either in person here with us in Riverside, we hope you'll come, or by live stream if you can't come here yourself. God be with you. Looking forward to seeing you.